live in a time in the last uh, 50 years, the demographics of our country have changed. We see people who are moving in from different places in the world. And you may come across and see more Muslims that are in our society, in our town, and their religion is growing. And they are devoted to the book. A lot of them are. Their book, the Quran. And we need to interact with them. God said, when Jesus was given his great commission, he told his apostles to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That word go is an interesting Greek word because we say, well, go. There's the command to go, and it's generic, and he didn't tell us how to go, and we, we get all that information there. We can go any way we want to. But the word go there to a Greek says, as you are going... As if this should be an habitual part of your life. As you're going along in life, you come across someone that you can talk to them about the scriptures, talk to them about their soul. And it takes the, sometimes the pressure of, we got to get a program up and I've got to do this and make these many calls. A lot of times it happens as life is happening. And I'm sure when you go to the store, you go shopping, you, you get out into the community, you see different things. Do you have a Muslim friend? I don't think I do. If I know it, I don't. Uh, if I'm supposed to know it, I don't. But as people of God, their souls are precious. And we should not avoid them. We should strive to want to teach them. They're going to have convictions for their book, the Quran. We got convictions in our book, the Bible. And I wanted to put them side by side this morning with you. Not Bible versus Quran. I could do that. And there is an idea there's a conflict between them. I understand that. But I thought as we're going by, I would deal with a chief objection, and I think it's a very central one, that taught Muslims have to the Word of God, our Bible. And I wanted us, if we ever had that conversation, I would like for us to be able to not just, well, I'm going to attack them, and I've got this doctrine. Well, wonder if they don't believe your Bible is pure. They think it's corrupted. And that's going to be the central thought. Muslims have been taught that our Bible is corrupted. So you talk about the resurrection of Jesus. You can talk about the deity of Jesus. You can talk about the three gods and one God and the religious world calls it the Trinity. You can talk about all those doctrines and if it ever gets a little tight for them, they don't have to listen to it. And their out will be, well, you know that your Bible has been corrupted. What do you do now? Bye. <laughs> See you later. Because we're dealing with a standard but it also works for the Muslim too. And what I'd like to do is establish in our hearts what the Bible claims about itself, and then we're going to explore two avenues by which we can answer the Muslim in a way that maybe he doesn't, he didn't think you'd be ready for. And I want to accomplish that in this lesson. First of all, are the scriptures inspired of God? Does the Bible claim that for itself? For itself. And we have already read. Corey read very well in 2 Timothy, the third chapter, that Timothy had known the sacred writings. Those would be the, the law of Moses. Know the sacred writings and, since he was a child. And now here's all scripture, which would include the gospel of Jesus Christ. And King James talks about all scripture. America instead, every scripture inspired of God, that's all of it, is profitable for teaching, for reproof, and so forth. But notice it says it is inspired of God. It is God-breathed. The writing is God-breathed. It didn't say the word is God-breathed. The spoken word is God-breathed. That's true. But this claims, this passage claims, that is what was written down was God-breathed. And that's impressive. To the point that we'll be thoroughly furnished unto every good work when we rely upon this God-breathed revelation. And so, 
We realize I need to have that passage. That's what it claims. This was not something that man invented. It was something that was breathed by God. Paul takes us in that same avenue of thought. When he talks about the whole plan of salvation, not just heaven, but the whole plan of salvation that entered not into the heart of man, never entered into his mind, that God has prepared for them. And he speaks about the contrast between the world and what he has as an apostle, inspired apostle. He said, we receive not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is from God. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth. Not in that words which man would do, well, he, he's speaking. But which the spirit teacheth. Combining spiritual with spiritual. Translate spiritual things, concepts, ideas. How do you communicate them? With spiritual words. So the Holy Spirit is involved in guiding Paul as an apostle. And that's exactly the way the men of God were guided. The third claim, the third point about the claim of being inspired of God is that no prophecy ever came by the will of man. How did it enter? That's what he means by no prophecy is a private interpretation. It didn't begin privately. It's in a context that we have the fulfilled prophecy before us. Jesus has fulfilled it. For no prophecy ever came by the will of man, but men spake from God, being moved by the Holy Spirit. So those three passages, God breathed it. How did you breathe it? I sent the Holy Spirit to guide the apostles. And that's true about all of God's people that wrote his word. That it didn't originate with them. That's why they couldn't understand certain things. But then they would be fulfilled in Christ. So the Bible claims to be inspired. The writing that we have, it's not just black ink on white paper and glued together in a binding. The very word, the message that it creates through these words, are the words are God-breathed. And that's his claim. And we need to know that. Secondly, is the Bible therefore authoritative? And that, I think it would follow. Yes, if it's from God, who has more authority than God? But the Bible makes it very clear that this is going to be the authoritative message in your life. In 2 John 9, if you go onward, say here's our boundary, you go onward and abideth not in the doctrine of, of Christ or the teaching of Christ, you don't have God. It's Paul's there. You, you don't have him. It's the teaching of Christ, stay in there. If I go beyond it, I don't have him. But if you abide in that teaching, you've got the son, because it's his word. But you also have the father, because he's his son. And there's our connection with God. So here becomes the authority of life. Or is God with you or not? Are you with God or not? The question is, how do you... Treat his word. And all of a sudden, that which could be very subjective in our decision making becomes an objective standard. First John, the second chapter. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. Oh, I can say all day, I know God, I know Jesus. But the objective standard, that standard that's out here outside of you and me, and that people can see... Do you keep his commandments? If you don't, you're a liar when you say you know him. But who are you to judge me? I, I know how I feel. I don't care how you feel. I care how God teaches. And he says, whoso keepeth the word, in him verily hath the love of God been perfected. Oh, I love Jesus. That can be very subjective. That's inside of me. Who are you to judge me? We've got an objective standard. Whoso keepeth his word, in him verily hath the love of God been perfected. Keeping his word. Hereby we know that we are in him. I'm in Jesus. How, how, what's the standard? I just feel it. Well, if it's true, you ought to himself walk even as he walked. I'm going to stay within his teaching because it's going to be authoritative in my life. And you know what happens when that happens? Unity occurs. That's the basis for unity. 
that we've got a standard for our lives. And we're not left to what others say or think are their ideas. Listen to how this works. These things, brethren, I have in a figure. He's been talking about himself and Apollos to expose the false teaching and the attitudes of the false teachers. But I've been applying that in a figure transferred these things to myself and Apollos for your sakes. That in us, the apostles and those who are on the side of God, that in us you might learn not to go beyond the things that are written. Yes, 2 John 9 said that's what's been written to the teachings of Christ. So I go beyond that, that no one of you be puffed up for the one against another. Puffed up. Hey, I, go, I know more than you do. Okay. What do you know? It's, 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 it's the Word of God. We're, we're, we've got a standard to follow. It's authoritative in our life because it connects us with Him who has all authority in heaven and on earth. That's Jesus Christ. And that honors His Father. It's inspired. It's authoritative. Has it been changed? It's going to be a very important question. Has it been changed? And the next day, has it been changed and therefore corrupted and, and you can't trust it? Well, here comes our first avenue with our Muslim friend. We could take this avenue. Because we have a lot of evidence that will lead us when you investigate the manuscript evidence. You can see that, no, I wouldn't say it's been changed since the day is written. What, do you have any originals? We don't have a one of the Bible. No originals. They didn't have Xerox machines back then, did they? No, they didn't. They made copies and copies and copies. And what is so interesting that when you look at there are more manuscript evidence for the Bible, but there's some 5,600 manuscripts. They are copies that connect with the original. We don't have the originals but they're, they were within a hundred years of the time in which the originals were written. Do you know how marvelous that is and how unique that is in ancient writings? Homer's Iliad. There's only 643 copies of that. That date and the earliest one is 500 years from the time it was written. And I've been in literature class, and we think every little word is important. And you got the message of Homer. It's 500 years of the time he wrote it. We don't have that many manuscript evidence to say, well, do we have the, the true text or not? But here was something that happened in the ancient world that these writings apparently were very important. And churches would make copies when they would get the letters from Paul. And while those originals are gone, you have these type of manuscripts. And wait, maybe a copyist error here, but there may be a copyist error here. You put them two together and you'll find, oh, I see. Because there's a lot of them that point out that this is really the error. And you can get a, a text that you can trust in. And it was written 100 years from the time in which it was first written in its original state. Pretty good evidence when you look at ancient writings of how many manuscripts and how close to the date of writing we really have, even though it's 100 years. In John Ryland's library, the, the, the college there, university there in Manchester, England, there's a three and a half by two and a half inch fragment front and back that has John 18, 31 through 33, portions of that text. I wonder how we can know that's the text because we see some of the lines are there and it's within 30 years. That's how it's been dated. But some said, no, it may have been 175 AD, maybe 200 AD. That's still pretty close to when John lived. But on the front of that, it's talking about his, his dealing with Pilate and Pilate's dealing with him. And on the back, it continues that in verses 37 through 38. And you know, it reads just like your Bible that you have in your lap today, or on your phone, whatever you're looking at. Kind of remarkable. A little piece of evidence. 
and says, all right, we're looking at something that's pretty ancient here. We're looking at a papyrus fragment here, and it's kind of getting the same lines that I've got in, in, in my Bible. Most of the New Testament has brought out uh, to almost all of it will be within 200 years, the original. But we have the whole New Testament that we have that's within 300 years of its writing that we can look to and realize, well, here was the gap between in which the first time it could have been written, and this is what we have. And we have New Testament like, like we have it today. If those New Testaments went out of the way, we would have left behind over 86,000 quotations from the church fathers, those who lived real close to the apostles, sometimes in the same uh, time in which they lived or shortly thereafter. And they would quote the scriptures that we have in our Bible. You can take there, there's 80, over 86,000 of them that you can do that. So there's another way of looking. Do we see that we have the Bible like it was originally written close to 100 years or maybe 30 years in which it's written? Is there evidence for that? Or are we just accept it? No, there's evidence for that. The latter part of 1946 to the early part of 1947, near the Dead Sea, there were 11 caves explored by some young shepherds. And they found what we have today is the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, that's remarkable, is that they've been dated, and those scrolls have been dated from 250 B.C. to 68 A.D. Apparently, these books were important to those people of that day. And they would make copies, and they would hide them. What's remarkable about the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are a number of things that are, but what's remarkable is that it bridged for us in the Old Testament. It bridged a thousand years of wonderment if we've got the original text or not, or if we've got what was close to that, because there have been that many years span between the Old Testament final book and the, the manuscript evidence that we have. This takes us back to 250 BC. The book of Daniel, the book of Isaiah reads just like you have it. That was remarkable. We've, we've got what they had. And we bridged a thousand years getting closer to uh, the event. And of course, during a bit, th that time, you had the Hebrew text being translated into the Greek. We have the Septuagint translation. And what were they translating from? So you can take that translation. They had the Hebrew manuscripts and was translated into the the Greek language, and Jesus would quote from that translation. He's comfortable with it. But we see all these pieces of evidence that are getting closer and closer to the time in which the originals were written and realize substantially they are the same. They don't change the message, and, and they don't cause us to have doubts about our text. And, and we can use that to people. We can use that to people who are atheists, People who are agnostic, they're just trying to find out. They deserve an answer. We're to be ready to give an answer for our, our hope, but now we're having to do that in our society. I want to tell you what my hope is based upon. Not just Jesus Christ, his resurrection, but that fact is based upon that we've got the God-inspired word, the authoritative word that is the foundation for us knowing that this is true. But that's not the only way to approach your Muslim friend. If this is going to be the examination of the Bible, let's put the Quran to a test and see why would a Muslim believe that our scriptures were corrupted? The Quran doesn't teach that. What does it teach? Question, are the scriptures inspired of God, Muhammad? In Surah, and that's just the idea of the chapters, verses 3 and 4, Muhammad is being talked to. He said, he has sent down to you, O Muhammad, the book in truth, confirming what was before it. 
He revealed the Torah and the gospel. Who revealed that? If I'm looking from the standpoint of a Muslim, Allah did that. I mean, your God says that he revealed the Torah, the law of the Jews, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what your Koran says. Continuing. He revealed this before as guidance for the people. And he revealed the Koran. What three books do you got going there? Torah, Law of Moses, Gospel of Christ, and the Koran. And about the order in which they came in history. Those who disbelieve in the verses of Allah, and he's talking about all three of them, will have a severe punishment. Oh, he's mighty in power, owner of retribution. But what we're seeing, where does Allah say that the Torah, did it come from man? Or was it revealed by God? In Surah 7, 157, those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, Muhammad, whom they find written in what they have of the Torah and the gospel. They claim that the law of Moses and the gospel, he spoke about Muhammad. Muhammad, why would you want to fulfill a corrupt Bible? Because he didn't believe it's corrupt. It came from God. Torah and the gospel enjoins upon them what is right and forbids them what is wrong. Makes a lawful, it makes, it makes lawful for them the good things, prohibits for them the evil, relieves them of their burden and the shackles which were upon them. You want success? So they will have believed in him, honored him, supported him, and followed the light which was sent down with him. If it, it is those who will be the successful type of person. But in that passage, exalting the Quran. They open it up and say, God revealed the other two as well. And you're telling me that you can't trust the Bible? Mohammed was told to. In fact, you don't need Mohammed to make judgments. In Surah 6, 114 say, then is it other than Allah I should... Seek as judge while it is he who has revealed to you the book. Explain in detail. And those to whom we previously gave scripture. Here's God speaking. We previously gave the scripture. Know that it's sent down from your Lord in truth. So never be among the doubters. Because you can make judgments based upon that law. The word of your Lord has been fulfilled in truth and in justice. None can alter his words. The second point is that it's revealed by God and Allah and their word, but it can't be altered. You're telling me it's been corrupt. And I know that he's speaking here about the Quran, but words that come from Allah cannot be altered. The Quran teaches that. None can alter his words. He is the hearing and the knowing. Chapter 5, verse 43. But how is it that they come to you for judgment, Mohammed? They don't need you. They have the Torah, in which is the judgment of Allah. Then, then they turn away, even after that, but those are not, in fact, believers. The story is, you'd have a cushion and there'll be a judgment cushion, and people were coming to Muhammad. Jews were coming there in order to receive judgment. And what he did, he took himself off the cushion, he put the Torah there, and realized, you don't need me. Because Allah has delivered the Torah before the Quran. Did they think it was corrupted? A lot of Part of the seventh century, you think it's all corrupted? Can't trust it? Your own Bible friend says that's not so. Let the people of the gospel, got the Torah can make judgment, let the people of the gospel 
by what Allah has revealed therein. Is it inspired of God, Allah, and your, and your viewpoint, dear friend? Yes, it is. He revealed it therein. And whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed, then is those who are the defiantly disobedient. The Torah and the gospel is revealed by God. And it was becoming authoritative and making judgments for the Jews, but the Quran superseded them. I'll grant you that in, in your view. But why would he want to praise a corrupted book? Remember, Allah's words can never be corrupted, can never be altered. And then we see in 68 of that same chapter, say, O people of the scripture, of the scripture, you are standing on nothing until you uphold the law of the Torah. The gospel and what has been revealed to you from your Lord, Mohammed. Allah has revealed it. And you're going to call me Lord? Torah and the gospel stand on the same platform as your Quran. And you're telling me it's been corrupted? I don't think they're prepared for that. But you're reading from their book. And that which has been revealed to you from your Lord will surely increase of them in transgression because they're not going to follow it. And that's going to be the standard that judges them in disbelief. So do not grieve over the disbelieving people. And he put the Torah and the gospel and the Quran in there. Has it been corrupted? No. But all of a sudden it opened a door for you to ask your question. Were the early Korans burnt? Every one of them were burnt. Nothing was written in Mohammed's days of his writings. But within two years after his death, one of his wives set out to, and those who were closest to Mohammed, we better get this in a book. The word Koran, spell it with a K or a Q, it's just transliterated means recitation, reciting. And what was never written down but recited, those closest to Muhammad realized we need to have this in a, in a book. And so those who were closest to him began to write things and they began to be variations of the Quran, recitation. And one of the things that happened is that Within a few years following his death, there was an occasion where 700 Muslim soldiers were killed, and they were very scared of thinking, well, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to remember these things unless we get them written down. And then they, uh, soldiers would be taking the different recitations of the Koran and calling each other a heretic because they were all different. And one of the leaders said, we're going to put a stop to that. We're going to have a unified Quran. Sahih Bihari, which is one of the second leading sources of manuscript evidence, hadith, for the Muslim faith. These things are documented. Tells a story of how they got burnt. Send us the manuscripts of the Quran. So we may compile the Quranic materials in perfect copies and return the manuscripts to you. Now here's Mohammed's wife. She had an original. And she didn't want to give it up. But she sent copies to Uthman, who was involved in bringing this event to take place. It was a historical event that caused the need for this. They had so many different variations, and it's going to divide the Muslim world, and these soldiers are out here calling each other heretics. If we're going to have a unified people, we've got to have a unified book. And they had the power to start all over and burn every one of them. Hashith wouldn't give up her copy. But when she died, about 637, they burned it. Because they made a copy that they were going to follow. 
a translation that they were going to follow. In the meantime, here are four men who were closely connected with Mohammed. One of them was a servant of his. And they had each written the recitations, the Quran. And they weren't about to give up their copy. But they had to. But not without a, a fight. Uthman then ordered four men to rewrite their manuscripts in perfect copies. After he'd done the Hafsab, which is his wife, Codex was returned to her. And Uthman returned the original manuscripts to her. And then after her death, they burned them. Uthman sent to every Muslim province one copy that had been copied and ordered all the other Quranic materials, whether written in fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, to be burnt. And those who were closest to Muhammad that heard him speak to them directly, they were going to have to burn theirs. And I just give you one. I could just put myself there. I've heard it from his mouth. And I'm going to have to burn that one? <laughs> How can you order me to recite the reading of Zaid when I recited from the very mouth of the prophet some 70 surahs? Am I, asked Abdullah, his servant, to abandon what I acquired from the very lips of the prophet? What a statement. Now, the Bible claims that men who walked with Jesus, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. These are just people that heard Muhammad speak directly to them. I recited it before him. You can trust this. I've got to give this up. And you know what? There are three chapters added to the one that they have to deal that Abdullah didn't have in his book. Don't add to God's word? Dear friend, whose book has been corrupted? Whose book can you really trust in? How do you know that you have the original things of, of, of Mohammed? They were all burnt. And today, the copy that is set forth is one of those four, the youngest one that lived longest got his and in 1920s is now what we can is considered the authoritative book that happened in the 1920s I think it's worth a discussion what are they going to say then and they may deny it all but this is part of their history and those who are Muslim scholars know the truth about this and it might be something that you can have in your arsenal. We're not fighting, not, to, not trying to fight your doctrine, but let's start here, let's examine the books and let's put them side by side. And your accusation that the Bible has been corrupted, I show evidence that, no, we got pretty close to what the original is, but what do you have, dear friend? And they may go home that night, fussing and fuming and denying and praising Allah, but I tell you, if they're honest people, They'll wrestle with that. They will wrestle with that. And maybe they'll be converted to the book of God. And that will be, as you go forth in your life, you may run across someone. Don't ignore it. Maybe you would like to have a Bible discussion with them. And just listen to them. That will be one of the things, especially when your doctrine is refuting the Koran. They will especially give that one. And I hope you'll be able to let them know a little bit about their history as well. That we could have a reasoning together about our books. There's only one way to the Father. And Jesus says, I am the way. It's not Mohammed. It's Jesus. And Mohammed didn't come along and give you another way or supersede the way of Jesus. Muslims believe Jesus existed. He was the son of Mary. They don't believe he was, a, he was God. In John 8, chapter, and we read verses 22 through 24, said, if you believe that I am here, you're going to die in your sins in that context. Believe that I am. Jesus claims to be Jehovah. I am. He's the eternal God. He's the eternal word. And we put our trust in him because he died, died. I know the Muslims deny it. He was raised from the dead. They deny it. And he is our Lord that we confess not Mohammed. And that's the truth of the gospel. And if you 
realize that this is the truth and we encourage you to confess Jesus. Confess him to be the son of God. Be baptized into him. And be raised to walk in the newness of life growing each day in his word. You'll never regret that step. It's a step of reason that's connected with your faith. And we trust that you will launch out on that and obey the gospel as we stand and sing.